Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Emma Malkolik. Hi. Thanks, Wayne, for asking me to share, and um, thanks to the first three speakers. And, you know, welcome to anyone, if you're new or struggling or returning or visiting, you know, this has been my home group, and, um, you know, this is where I heard what I needed to hear um, in order to, you know, recover from my alcoholism. And, um, you know, I just, you know, I'm really grateful for this home group and uh, for the experience here. And, you know, I've had um, wonderful sponsorship. Gail, who took me through the steps, Catherine, who I had for a few years, and Andy, who's taken me um, for the last couple of years. And, um, you know, not only that, but great friends and examples of Alcoholics Anonymous in this group. So I just get that out of the way to begin with. But um, just thank you. It's just been incredible. And, um, you know, before I got here, when I was drinking, you know, I just love what alcohol did for me. You know, I was so I just thought I was so nervous and quiet and awkward all of the time. And just when I got drunk, you know, I didn't care what people thought of me. I just, you know, I talked to boys I fancied. I'd go to nightclubs. I would just, I just loved the effect that it had on me. And, um, you know, I just went out and got drunk um, every weekend. I drunk as much as I could, what I could, as often as I could. And, you know, there were sort of consequences right from the start. I never you know I never drunk like a lady or anything like that it was just mad to begin with and um you know it progressed quickly you know within a couple of years when I was sober life was just unbearable I was so full of fear and paranoid and um I just couldn't handle life it all seemed too much and when I was drunk it it I was just sort of I don't know it just I was just a suicidal wreck all of the time you know I'd be cutting my wrist and ring up my mum say I want to die and the only thing that sort of gave me temporary relief normally was a bloke, you know, and I'd be all right for a little while. And um, it just, it was just dreadful. And come the end, you know, I just didn't know what to do with myself. I always, you know, it was always, oh, if just this would happen, it would be all right. Or if I just ran more, lost a bit of weight. If this would happen, if I didn't hang out, you know, all the time, there's always something. If only that, then it would all be all right. But, um, you know, it just was never all right, and I tried to stop drinking, tried controlling it, tried staying in, you know, all sorts of different things, just to sort myself out, and um, it was just emotionally, I just couldn't, ha- just couldn't handle it, and um, oh, I, d- I just had enough, and I was 17, and, you know, I didn't know whether I was an alcoholic or not, but I just knew I just couldn't have lived like that any longer, I just couldn't, couldn't continue to drink and just being sober was was unbearable and you know I'd come here and um I I just heard about alcoholism you know it it didn't matter what you drank how much you drank how old you were what your circumstances were any of that you know I just heard about alcoholism once I picked up that first drink it set off a craving beyond my control and um, no matter what the consequences, how bad, you know, all of that, I would always eventually drink again. And, um, you know, people just shared with such conviction. And I went home, I read my big book, and I just could identify completely that I was an alcoholic of the type described in, in the big book. And, um, you know, and I, I was also beaten enough to be willing to ask for a sponsor on that on that night and um I got a temporary sponsor and I just did what she said you know I didn't understand it didn't like it my head was a mess I was full of contradictions I don't want to ring anybody I didn't really get what why I had to do these things or anything like that but the bottom line was regardless of all of that you know I just sort of got on and did it and um you know and got into service quickly you know with like my second meeting I think I was doing service and um, just ringing people ring my sponsor I remember the first time I called Gail actually my first sponsor you know and um, I was I'd ringing up I don't know what I'm gonna have to say to you do you know what I mean but I can just remember just making that phone call and as a result of putting in the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous 
you know, that obsession with alcohol was just removed from me, you know, quickly within a week or so. And, um, you know, my sponsor started me on the 12 steps and, um, you know, I just, just got on and did it and, you know, making my inventory, I can, you know, I just said, well, but I don't really have all of those defects characters. I can see that I'm a bit jealous sometimes and, you know, and she sort of went through them and, and I realized, you know, I, I suffered greatly with them all and I learned to take my inventory honestly and, um, you know, did my step five and, and that was just incredible to get all of that fear and resentment and the sexual conduct all down on paper and, and share it with somebody and, and just to be sort of freed of it, you know, I didn't, wasn't, didn't have that ashamed, dirty, horrible feeling that I had when I, when I'd walked in, you know, after doing my step five, it was like I was freed from that and, you know, I was sort of given a second chance really. And that, that was, step was incredible, but, um, you know, I did my step six and seven and then it got to my step eight and um I think that I found harder to to write than I did my step four and um there was people on there I still thought they'd harm me more than I'd ever harm them but that wasn't the point of it really you know it was about looking how I behaved and reacted and how that affected the people around me and you know you hurt my hurt the people I love the most really and I had to look at all of that and from doing that you know I was completely willing to to make amends them all and um you know I started making my amends and um you know they all went really well you know people just uh, just accepted that do you know what I mean I was just pleased that I was all right and that I was get, get, getting on with my life really and um you know but as a result of doing those step nines to begin with the relationships you know I've built over in time are just priceless and only as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous um, that, I've, that they're there. And, you know, like my mum said, you know, our family has really been saved and by Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, from police and social workers and just chaos to just mild chaos that it is now, you know, nothing official, <laughs> but there's always some sort of mini drama going on or something. Do you know what I mean? But that's just life. But, you know, it isn't what it what it was and um you know and just just trying to be do you know what I mean just trying to be a good daughter a good sister you know all of those things just trying to practice the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous and um you know I've got great relationships with my family and um you know working through the rest of the steps you know I've never been um a big um I've always taken lots of inventory actually and um, step 10 continue to take my inventory and um, take a lot of fear inventory those resentments just don't disappear do you know what I mean they just keep coming but I just keep taking my inventory ring my sponsor doing what I need to do just to maintain what I found here and step 11 it's a spiritual retreat tomorrow isn't it I've never been a, a one for like going to church regularly or having some set devotion or anything like that but you know I just have some quiet time each day and and just read different spiritual books and what I've done has changed you know it changes all the time different things I do but just just trying to do that and you know step 12 just trying to carry this message you know through service when you're asked to share and and really just getting into good habits early has just just helped me so much you know at, just at the beginning you know just saying yes, just doing your service to the best of your ability, just turning up on time, doing all those simple things, you know, and and now, you know, if you're asked to do something, you can do it, you know, automatically. You just just say yes and just get on with it, you know, and and just trying to do service and all of those things is just vital to, to my own recovery. Um, yeah, and, you know... I, when I got here, I just thought that that's it, really. My life's over, you know. What am I doing here? <laughs> you know, three times a week in a church hall and the rest of the night, what am I going to do? Watch telly or something? And, um, you know, I really felt like that that's it, you know, I was going to be boring and um, all of that. But um, I've just, I was so myself short if I thought that, you know, my li life just took off to begin with. And the first couple of years of recovery, um, in this group were just just amazing you know all the things meeting up for coffee girls nights out girls nights in you know 
celebrated my 18th birthday with the girls in the meeting. Girl did my 21st birthday with the girls in the meeting. Um, girls' holidays. Um, just just loads of stuff. The netball, you know, all loads of different things. Um, that's just what we've done in the group, you know, and all of that has just been fantastic. But also, you know, I sort of went to uni, moved away, went out, you know, loads of, like, it just had an incredible time. And then, um, you know, sort of, it, it, it's just been incredible. And, um, you know, I've been back to uni and I've got a professional job starting next month and, um that's incredible, you know, I, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, do you know what I mean? I'm a bit of a screw-up and, you know, I've got a professional job starting next month. You know, it, that is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's because I've just applied the principles which I've been taught here to turn up to work, to st study, you know, all of those things, just just communicating with people, which I just couldn't do because I was so self-centered, you know, just, just talking to people, you know, all of those things and, and you know, that's incredible and um you know and sponsorship's been vital throughout you know i think i was probably quite good for a few years you know i just do what my sponsor said and sort of life was fairly easy and then when you don't do what you not no you don't do what you sponsor when you don't listen to the experience um that's been given you um which i've done do you know what i mean and get myself into all sorts of trouble but i've always just been honest with my sponsor and, um, you know, it's all sort of come right in the end. You know, I've got a lovely little baby and, um, you know, life is fantastic. But, you know, that, there was a period where it was probably a bit messy. And that's one just because I didn't, I wouldn't listen to my sponsor. I wouldn't listen to old timers in this group. And that's, you know, I've manufactured my own misery at times. And I suppose that's all part of life. Do you know what I mean? And um, just learning to, and through those times, just maintaining what I found here, you know, just keeping the basics, reading my big book, reading my Just For Today cards, turning up to the meeting, going for coffee, sharing when you don't feel like it, just putting in the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous, regardless of what's going on. And, you know, you sort of get through good times, medium times, you know what I mean, when everything's just all right and, you know, just, just through anything. And... um you know, that's that's the beauty of it all, really. You know, just continuing to do what you did in the beginning. And, um, you know, I've started to read my little big book. Um, I have done for a few years, actually, just my little one every day. But um, I got out my big, big book this week just to have a look through it. And, um, you know, all the different markings from all the um, big book study groups and different things I've wrote in over the years. And it's quite... I don't know, like a bit nostalgic, really. Do you know what I mean? Like going through all the different bits, but, you know, it's been quite nice and just remembering different things and um, sort of looking back over the last few years, it's just been, oh, I don't know, it's a bit emotional, really, or something, do you know what I mean? But it's just incredible what Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and this group, you know, this is my home group. And, you know, if you are new or struggling, you know, I just... What's on offer here is just incredible. You know, you don't want to miss out what's available in Alcoholics Anonymous through putting in the actions, putting your thinking aside, working through these 12 steps. And, um, you know, your life can change from probably the hell it is at the moment until, you know, you can have a, a good sober life and enjoy it, really. Do you know what I mean? That's what's on offer for us. And that there's so many examples in this meeting of people who've, just huge transformations in their lives and, you know, great experience and, you know, and and that's what we've got here. You know, I moved away for a, for a little while and uh, went to lots of different meetings and um, you know, it was like no one would go for coffee, no one would talk to you at the meeting unless you spoke to them, you'd get cross-shared at. It was always some, you know, it was awful, you know. Um, well, it wasn't awful. Do you know what I mean? I just went to meetings, but it wasn't wasn't what you get here. You know, I used to drive down to Bristol once a month just so I could go to a road recovery meeting, you know, until I could get home next time. Just to, you know, because this is the Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I know really. And that, and that's what I wanted to maintain. How long have I got, Debs? 
Ten minutes, Christ. Well, I'm probably not going to do ten minutes. You think you've got ten years to practice. You're ten years, yeah. And you get to the night and you, and you screw it up, Christ. <laughs> Hopefully Chris has fudged up the recorder and something. But, um, yeah, so I haven't, haven't done no, that great. But, um, yeah, it's just lots of different th- you know when mum's sharing tonight you can probably tell why i'm an alcoholics anonymous can't you <laughs> you know the um and the stories i could tell but i probably won't <laughs> and that's just from last weekend but um <laughs> no really joking she said um oh well, it's good because i can share after you but she didn't know she was sharing so i can share after her so she had to be careful didn't she what she said tonight um, but, you know, we used to go out a few times actually together drinking and um, it would always end up, God knows what, do you know what I mean? I can, there's a few times and um, I won't mention, <laughs> but, you know, like we go out and get ready to go to AA together now, do you know what I mean? And, you know, that, that's just wonderful and, um, you know, great friends I've made in this meeting as well, you know, just... Um, you know, it says in the big book, you know, make lifelong friends. And you probably knew and looking around thinking these aren't the people I sort of hang out with. But, um, you know, you, they do become lifelong friends. And there's only um, me and Chris, actually, from our year group left. And I think that's it, actually. There was a few more, but sort of dwindled off. And that that's just like, there's probably, God knows how many in that first year, probably 30 or 40 of us to begin with do you know what I mean or you know lots of people but there's only two of us left now and you all the people that have come and gone and um like people are your best friends you wouldn't don't even talk to in the street anymore do you know what I mean like all of that but you just have to um make the most of what you've got at the moment I suppose and the people that are here and um sponsor and um you know things like things like that but it's quite funny how how it all changes but um i lost my thread then but yeah i I probably won't go on much longer but just just to say really you know just just thanks a lot you know um i've just got a wonderful life and it's because you lot showing me what i needed to do in alcoholics anonymous and continuing to to show me what I need to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're new, you know, really don't miss out on this. I couldn't have imagined the life I have now when I come in here. I could, after I did my step four, Gail asked me to write a list of things that I would like. Um, not like, but how, you know, what I would want out of life or something. And, you know, I just would have sold myself short completely, you know. Um, what I've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous has been far greater than anything I could have thought of when I was newly sober um you know so if you're new you know really don't miss out on it listen to the people who've gone before you be willing to take in the actions just shut your mouth when times are you know when you when you've got those phone calls of your sponsor and you're do you know what I mean just 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 get on with it and um you know they've got your best interests at heart and they're the ones with the experience and you know if you want to maintain what you found or you want to get sober you know you just got to keep walking the road and just um just getting on with it and thanks a lot thanks my name is Derek I'm an alcoholic and I'm from Glasgow and I hope you can understand the accent if you can't I'll do in sign language um it's a, a great night to be sober a Friday evening can you imagine can you imagine us all having a slip tonight? Can you imagine us all having a relapse? And the, the SES couldn't handle it, you know? Uh, but I'm so blessed and I'm so glad to be here in Plymouth. And I thought as a gift to you, I'd bring the rain. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the rain. You brought your rollies and bags and everything else. But my story is like everybody else's, uh, previous speakers. Uh, my sobriety day is, uh, the 5th of April 1987 and I know you're dying to tell me I don't look it but there you are uh, don't let the, the grey hair fool you because all I wanted to do as a kid was box amateur and professional I love boxing uh, I, I love what it what it was all about Muhammad Ali was was my, my, my idol my hero 
And you could probably tell with my stunning good looks, I was quite, quite a good boxer. Uh, the high cheekbones, the, the, the lovely pointed nose. Um, but I wasn't, I was, I was quite bad actually. Uh, in fact, I was that bad, they called me Picasso because I was always on the canvas. Um, <laughs> But I was there, I did it, I seen what alcoholism did in the household, I seen what it did in the family, and I thought, well, okay, I, I need to do something here. And, uh, cause alcoholism killed my mother, she died at 42 with cirrhosis of the liver, and I had an infant, uh, an effect on my father too, who also, uh, had problems with alcohol. And here, being the youngest of a family of five in Glasgow, and being a twin, yeah, I'm a twin, there's another one of me, I'm the good looking one, uh, and uh, I thought, I'll never touch booze, I'll never touch alcohol. And that was said when I was very, very young. And lo and behold, at the age of 23, I arrived in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. The problem with drinking. The boxing career had gone. I got written warnings in the workplace. The friendships of people had been difficult. And here I am in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was staying with my auntie, who was my mother's sister who was concerned how I was going. And, uh, but booze did something for me, you probably heard that even sex couldn't do for me. It just gave me that sensation, that experience of something that I always wanted to be. I always wanted to matter. I always wanted to be something or somebody. And I'm five foot ten, and when I took alcohol, when I took that first drink, that uh, half shandy, and that, sh- uh, that sherry afterwards, it just, it just, it elevated me into something. You with me? Yeah, I think some of us can identify with that. It made me taller, it made me even more handsome. Now, I need to get that right. And it made me even more handsome. In fact, Mel Brooks, um, was it Mel Brooks or Mel Gibson, even thought, uh, <laughs> thought of putting a, a, a strain order on me because he thought I was just too good looking. But, uh, but my point is, I just thought, this is, this is fantastic. And yet when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, my tail between my legs, being and with people with white hair, grey hair, teeth that wasn't their own, telling me it's good to see young things getting it, I just felt there's something not right about this. So what I decided to do, and because I always used to thought I was quite a smart guy. I still can be at times, you know. Uh, I thought, this AA thing's not going to work out for me. I'll need to make a comeback. I was a bad boxer at one time, and here's me thinking, I'll make a, even, I'll make a sensational comeback and, uh, and do better. I'll knock her down, I'll train harder, I'll lay off, I'll lay off the beer, I'll lay off the whiskey, I'll stay away from Daft Jimmy or uh, Crazy Johnny and Big Bertha. Big Bertha, she was just awesome, but she was bad news, you know. Uh, and I had these wonderful ideas and expectations I was going to make. All these wonderful things happen. But then after a short time, the obsession, which I now know is a language, came back. One more time. You'll be okay. You'll be fine. And lo and behold, I started a, a journey that brought me to my knees and brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous on the 5th of April, 1987. But really beaten with this idea that I'm suffering from alcoholism. And that began a journey. And it began an adventure. An adventure of growth. You see, although my drinking, my alcoholism was less than 10 years, I just could not go any further. If I could and I would, then I'd do it. I mean, what Glaswegian, what Glasgow man, uh, would want to come to meetings of AA and say, I'm, I'm beat, but I had to. Uh, but I just knew that I had to do something a bit particular, and I was brought to a condition and a mindset that I was screwed, I was powerless. And I'd love to give you the Mills and Boons version of that when I came to AA, everything lit up, I met the, I, I met the great sponsor, I got the big book, but I got the big book, what was the big book, the special big book, I got everything, it fell into places, but it wasn't, it didn't happen that way. My recovery uh, was difficult. Uh, uh, and recovery for me uh, does carry and have side effects uh, and I've got a limited time here to give you an, an expression and a share on that I'll do my best so the, the lady at the front might be throwing her chair at me shortly if I go over my time but what I will say to you is that 
I can tell you a lot more about my consequences. I can tell you about my homelessness. I can tell you about my isolation. I can tell you about the fist fights. I can tell you about the, 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 the sexual, the emotional, the financial. I can tell you all the stuff that we all know about. We all know about that conversation. You know, waking up the next morning with, you know, Big Bertha again, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> never again. Or, or somebody else, but you don't want to, you don't want to say that just in case, you know, uh, not paying the bills, overdapping, overdrawing. But really what troubled me was the inability to stay away from drink. A man can't drink. You know who I am? You know, I'm the so-called a uh, smart guy, but I couldn't hack it. I couldn't make it. it doesn't matter whether it was beer, lager, lime, whiskey, white tornado, buck fast. Um, you, you've heard of buck fast? Well, I've heard of it tonight and I can tell you. They should ban that stuff. Uh, but here I am, I'm, 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 I'm conscious that my, my mother died of alcoholism, my, my father had an effect on it, I was affecting my family, they were concerned about my, my safety and well-being. Uh, and here I am in AA, but this is where the real, this is where the real challenges began. Here I had, I had these feelings, these emotions, these ideas. Uh, I was one of these guys who just could not handle life, who could not handle sobriety. You follow? Just couldn't handle emotions. When a bill came through the door, <laughs> what do you do with that? Uh, what do you do with noisy neighbours? I'm, I'm, I'm no longer, I'm, I, I no longer have the alcohol to go up and chat at the door and say, you know, by the way, turn the music down or else. Uh, I had to sort of come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I served my apprenticeship. I went to a guy who seemed to have what I wanted, but he had a piece about him. You know, I was unhappy. I was, you know, uh, internally inside, I was, I was, you know, I, it was doom and gloom. You with me? I just had that sense of impending doom about me. I was walking about, you know, uh, I used to go to meetings and hear people say, I'm, 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 I'm glad to be here sober. And you get, you know, you get these smart arses and they say, well, you're happy to let your face know, uh, and, and things like that, you know. And, uh, I would come to meetings and, and by the way, there was nothing wrong with it and I enjoyed it. But it was only for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. And then I'd go back to, by this time, I, I had my own flat, and I'd be sitting uh, as a young man in recovery, 26, 27, uh, with the blind shut and the TV on, and thinking about, think, uh, thinking about my past, thinking about my thoughts, thinking about my, my shitty life, thinking about, you know, all that negativity. And I, I, I now understand why, why I drank, why the, the idea of alcohol became seductive and became attractive. Uh, so thankfully there was somebody around who told me the truth about alcoholism. Thankfully too, there was people around who understood uh, about how it works and why it works. And one of the things I've learned about this journey, and one of the things that I still say today, is that when I come to a meeting of alcoholics and all this, I pay attention to the speaker, regardless of what's going on in my own head. Uh, because I'm conscious today, I, I, I'm a great one for paying attention to the detail. I found out in this journey that I can get AA uh, on the bargain bucket aisle. I can get cheap grace. I can come along here and come to fellowship and learn a lot about things. I can get things in AA. I can learn about your your relationship thing. I can learn about your financial problems. I can learn about other things. I can come to fellowship and pick up things too. I can pick up, you know, vulnerable people. I can, you know, I can come to AA and get a lot of good, good things, you know, another sort of uh, high, another form of spiritual dope. I can maybe come to the meetings and, uh, I'll go to that meeting tonight. Why? Because, uh, we've got, a uh, uh, sexy Susie. She's doing the talk table tonight and, you know, she, she might want to see me. Uh, or I can go along a, uh, I might go along a, uh, Wine and Wayne's meeting, uh, because, uh, nothing personal, uh, but, <laughs> uh, look, he's a, he's a great laugh. He's dead funny. I know, and you know, that might give me that, that might give me that sort of form of spirit to dope, I feel good for a wee while, but it doesn't deal with this malady. Because, uh, I need to understand what is my true condition. Am I a real alcoholic? Or am I drink, am I a heavy drinker with other mental and emotional issues? Maybe I'm a raging codependent with a slight drinking problem. Maybe I'm a, you know, a rampant sex addict who, who's, who's untreated, who's got a wee drinking problem, who's an AA looking for, uh, looking for opportunities, you know. Uh, but I had to understand, do I suffer from alcoholism or do I not? I'm in the right fellowship. I've got the right malady, but I'm in the right fellowship. And that's what I discovered. Yeah, I'm the real deal. I am the real deal. I'm the sort of guy who will die of alcoholism. You're looking at me tonight, 
you know what a handsome, yeah, uh, 52 year old man, yeah, yeah again, yeah, 52, uh, the cat out the bag there, uh, but I had to understand, I'm in the right place, I've got the right problem, what is the solution? So I talked to a man who was armed the facts about himself, who was able to tell me something that I didn't quite know, that there was a solution here. So I go down to cause the condition. I'm powerless. I cannot manage the decision, the vow, the pledge, even the wish or vow to stay away from the first drink. I had to wake up to that reality. The first step tells me of my condition. It doesn't tell me. That's it. I'm alcoholic. I'm powerless. What is my solution? I needed to find that solution. And the solution is very simple. It's in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. They've even written a book for somebody like me who's God stupid. You know, I'm God stupid because you think ah, I'm God. I've got a thing called, maybe, maybe none of you have got this, but I've got a thing called ego. Ever heard of that? Yeah, I'm in the right place. Anyway, um, and I had to understand that, yeah, that this book was written for people like me who were going to go that way. So I made a couple of sort of baby decisions that I was going to get well. But if I was going to get well, there had to be a sort of condition that I was going to be happier in it. And I took stock, made a decision, went to this guy, said, going to help me through this process, and he did. And I'm just going to uh, rattle through it as best and as quickly as I can. And I'm not telling you uh, this is how you should do it. I'm not telling you uh, uh, that you're doing it right or wrong. I'm only sharing my experience here. I made a decision with the sponsor, I went down and I said, look, I need a hand here. In step three, I'm going to turn my life and my will over to this power greater than me, which for me nowadays is God. And, but I didn't understand the mechanics of that because I, I realized one of the things that was really, really prevalent in my life was uh, this thing called, you know, pride, uh, <coughs> where I thought I can uh, get, away with, get away with certain things. So I had to take stock and I looked at my resentments. You know, I looked at all those bitches and bastards who hurt me and offended me and caused me pain and shame and made me feel this way. If it wasn't for him or her, I'd be okay. If you only behaved yourself, I'd be alright. I had this sort of idea that if people only treated me right, I'd be fine. If Nick would just sort of, you know, just talk to me better, I'd be okay. You ever been to meetings with people, even subtle, even subtle things such as, or even come to meetings and people give you that kind of handshake? You know, sort of, you know, like that. Good, to, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Or they give you a hug and it's like that, you know, and they just, I, I'll take that personally. I say, I'll oh, shake his hand again. I tell you, I hope he takes a drink actually. Uh, imagine having that, you know. Uh, but that, that was, that was the nature of my resentment and understand why resentment is so well covered uh, in the book, three and a half pages. Why did he spend so much time to, cause it, it's a sort of, emotion that will take me out, sarcasm, gossip, you know, that internal condition, you know, being, being two-faced, hi, it's good to see you, you know, uh, just having that sort of, you know, uh, that, that, that feature of me, uh, which was, you know, uh, caused me problems, because I was addicted to resentments, <laughs> I love getting off and taking your inventory and talking about you afterwards and later on and, uh, and that sort of thing, I had an expectation of people uh, which was, they, they didn't even know they had. And then I looked at my fears, fear of getting something I didn't want, like the truth, uh, or the fear of losing something that I did want, uh, like, you know, uh, a wee bit of, you know, I like to be top dog, you know, in fact, I like to be number one, I like to be in control. And I looked at that end column, because my sponsor was saying, let's look at the end column, Derek, where you play God. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then looking at the sex conduct. <laughs> The sex conduct. That's a different fellowship. Anyway, uh, but you understand what I'm saying here. Looking at the end column of, of how I like to run the show, how I like to control and manage outcomes, how I like to control and manage relationships, how I like to be seen in, in the best light when behind the scenes, you know, I really wasn't all that smart. I really was addicted to my way and, and, and you know, that feel good experience. Uh, but really it was all about pride. Then having a conversation with a like-minded person saying, this is what I think, this is what I do, and sharing that. And sharing that, why? Because it was blocking me off the sunlight and the spirit. This willfulness, this willfulness, uh, where I was, you know, 
playing God, not only in my own life, but that in the lives of others. Namely now my wife, I met Agnes, my wife, she couldn't resist my deep sea blue eyes, bubbly personality and high cheekbones and fair and loving pay. I always have that effect, especially with men, anyway. Uh, but I always have that effect with people. But I realised that, uh, that relationships were challenges for me. I found that if you ever want to want a program recovery, then get involved in a relationship and see how well you do with your character defects. Uh, that's been my experience. And our children too. Uh, and work colleagues. I was just one of these guys who was very hard and difficult to, to go on with because I like to uh, do things my way. And here I am learning about a form of humility and going to my sponsor and going to uh, this power great myself of God and saying, right, I'm done. You know, I'm done here. Let, let's try it your way. And come to that sort of, uh, that uh, inconvenient and part of truth that no longer uh, was my life going to be in my hands. It was now going to be in the hands and direction of a power great myself and God. And taking stock and looking at the people that I'd offended and the people that I'd harmed, not only, uh, you no, know, by character, uh, or financially or el- elsewhere. And been going back to them and saying, look, okay, um, I caused you harm. I was selfish, self-centered. I'm in recovery. I'm now willing to sort of set the record straight. What is it I need to say or do to make it right with you? And do that with sincerity. Because sincerity wasn't in my vocabulary. You know, I'm one of the, I was one of the most <laughs> insincere guys you could ever want to meet or be experienced. But I was willing to now do that because I'd made a pact. I made a non-negotiable commitment and resolve that I was never going to use alcoholism as a way out. And by this time, I felt spirited. And I made restitution to the people that I'd, I'd taken from, including the creditors, the people that I wouldn't pay back to. And the real deal for me that the obsession for alcoholism had been removed. And, and that is the joy for me. That is the joy. The joy of, you know, doing this process within 20 pages of the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. The obsession is going to be removed. For an alcoholic, what a joy that is. How many meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous do I need to attend to get that good news? Now I was doing stacks of meetings and I was doing stacks of talking, but yet in the book called Alcoholics and Norm, it was telling me when I follow these directions with a light minded person, I was going to get a spiritual experience sufficient that it was going to remove the obsession. And there you are. And that's what happened. And then the real challenge for spiritual growth for me was living a day at a time through pages 84 to 88. <coughs> living through, uh, this power great myself which thankfully today is not God. And, you know, I've done all different phases of spiritual growth. I've, you know, I joined and I was a member of the AA police for a short time. Uh, you know, in fact, I got my uniform, I got my shirt and tie, got my wee badge, I got my big book, I got my 12 by 12, I got the companion guide, I got the reference book, and, uh, I, I, I went to meetings and I monitored people. Uh, it was a phase, but it was a damn good phase, you know, uh, I loved it, you know what I mean, I had that kind of walk, you know, oh, here he comes, you know, and, and I had my wee sort of a uh, routine, and I would come in and correct people, uh, by the way, according to the book, alcohol, it's enormous, and page such and such, and that page section, whatever else, uh, you're wrong, <laughs> and I'm right, and, you know, that self-righteous, pompous phase that some of us go through, Maybe none of you have went through that. Maybe I'm unique, because I always like to think I'm unique, you know. Uh, uh, but I retired from the A police uh, some time ago, uh, due to complaints, quite a few complaints. <laughs> you know, uh, I, 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 what my, my sponsor said to me, says, you've got great insight, you've got great knowledge, you've, okay, you've got a good message, but the messenger... Is rubbish, you know. It says something else, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on my language. Um, but so I've learned in the, in, the, in the last while about love and compassion. I've learned it's all it's all good going to a, a, XA speakers and listen to your favourite AA speaker and come to the meeting and quoting them. It's it's all good uh, getting involved and hooking up with the recovery stars, you know, the big shots in America. And you know, it's great to have. Oh, by the way, my sponsor's American, uh, you know, or or or, or 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 whatever else. But you know something, the real deal for me today. The real humility, the real sincerity is, uh, is sitting down with my fellow human being in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and sharing my story in a non-judgmental, uh, less self-righteous way and letting this person know that he's no, that he or she is no longer alone. Because that's love. 
That's love. And it pains me. It pains me. When I come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I see members of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, being misinformed, uh, being mismanaged, and being given, uh, you know, an AA, which is not AA. You know, I, I hear about uh, emotional sobriety, uh, uh, Step Ahead, or, or other books and literature, which really can wrong foot people into a, a way of thinking which has got nothing to do with the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous and seeing folks getting confused and getting lost in the maze of this wonderful spiritual journey. And I'm an advocate of uh, keeping it real and keeping it simple. I am. No matter who you are, what you are, how tough you are, how sexy you are, how, how smart you are, or how rich you are, if you've got a problem with alcoholism and if you're, you, you want to get well and you're looking for a close mouth friend, you've got my attention. Really you have. I don't care what country you come from or what you think of me. I know you're probably thinking so well of me right now and probably think he's the best. Then, then uh, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, but if you're suffering from alcoholism and you want a soft place to fall and you want somebody who's walked that walk, who's talked that talk and who's not going to judge you, who's not going to control your outcomes, who's not going to manage your life, who's just going to listen to you and share their experience strength and hope and the spirit of this process, then you've got my attention. I can't fix you. I can't, you know, give you the, the magic pill or cure. But what I can do is share my experience with you. Because of what one of the things I have learned is real alcoholics die alcoholism. It's cliched. It might be a little sound bite. It might be a buzzword. But really, sitting in a hall, you know, face to face, knee to knee, heart to heart with a fellow alcoholic, just try to share this journey with us, is the most meaningful conversation that I've ever had with alcoholics in this business. And I love being sober. I love living sober. My son, who's now 20, he's a man now. He shares a, he shares a home. He's never seen his dad drunk, but he's seen his dad at his worst when he's off been. My wife, Agnes, who, who, who's Irish, Scots, uh, has never seen me drunk, but she's seen her husband at the worst of his malady. And my daughter, uh, who's 16, I call her Miss Tippy Toes, um, she's never seen her father drunk. But where it matters for me today is in the home, is in the relationships. But where it really matters to me too is when I'm talking to my fellow alcoholics, talking to them with a sense of civility, and a sense of courtesy, and a sense of, you know, that give them the eye and attention and not trying to not to try to put them in a position where they feel awkward and uncomfortable with me. And I've had to learn that. It wasn't always like that, folks. I was, you know, there was a time of sobriety. I was pompous and sanctimonious and, you know, uh, that way inclined. But do you know something? I've learned over the years just to be a bit more humble and a bit more sincere. And do you know something? It's been, it's been very helpful for me. So I want to thank you all for your time and attention. And, you know, uh, if you haven't understood my accent, I know uh, they've got a special tape which goes slower for you later on to stick it on if you can't uh, make it out. But it's been a joy being here today. It truly has. And, you know, if there's anyone out there struggling, if there's anyone thinking about going back out there uh, to try it again, then please don't. And, by the way, if I've said anything that's caused you any concern, or anything that's upset you in it, come talk to me. Not about me. Come talk to me and we'll, we'll, we'll compare notes and we'll share. If I cause you any indifference, then I'm happy to sort it. But the most important thing is, for me, is that when I come to a meeting of alcohol, it's enormous, is that know that you're loved. Know that you are cared for. And the, the biggest and best news is that you can recover. It's a fantastic journey. And I'm having a ball. So Plymouth, thanks for having me. I'll speak to you later. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.